Hello, aviators. Welcome back to the Aviator's Guide. I hope you enjoyed my last episode where I continued my mini series, Ways to Build Flight Hours, where I covered renting, building, and buying. Make sure to check it out if you missed it. While I do have more ways to build flight hours to get out to you guys, and I will get those out to you, today let's go over how to properly fill out your logbooks, whether you use paper, electronic, or both. I will also be including some very good to know and interesting details of some federal aviation regulations or FARs that you may not even know. While I know you all probably most likely have your instructor fill out your logbook for you after your lessons, I know I did. It's really good to know how to do it for yourself because believe it or not, not all instructors are perfect. So this is a way that you can just double check their work. If you need a logbook, then you can get them on Amazon or you can go to mypilotstore.com and that website has just about everything you could ever possibly need to get your aviation journey started. And yes, of course, like I mentioned before, you can go the electronic logbook route. I personally prefer redundancy, so I not only have a paper logbook, but an electronic logbook. I started out with a paper logbook, of course, like most people do, and then I added the electronic logbook somewhere around 1100 hours. I fully recommend that you start logging electronically well before that because it takes a lot of time to backlog all of it. Regardless, you're definitely going to want an electronic logbook because when it comes to applying for jobs, it's going to be a huge time saver in totaling up your hours. For the electronic logbook, there are a bunch of different versions out there, most of which cost money, obviously, right? But if you have a four flight subscription that you're already paying for, guess what? It comes with a logbook in there. Along with all of your lessons, you can also get all of your endorsements signed off in that four flight logbook by your instructor. Besides four flight, there's log 10, there's Excel pilot logbook, logbook.aero, that's A-E-R-O, logbook pro, lots of other ones. And then the one that I personally use, myflightbook.com, which is, get this, free. I know that you all flight students out there love free. I haven't had any problems with my flight book, and it also has an app version as well as the website version. When it comes to paper logbooks, not all of them look the same when it comes to the layout. For choosing your paper logbook, I personally prefer Gleim, G-L-E-I-M. I put the link to that logbook in the show notes if you want it. And as I point out to you why I like the Glime logbook, we'll be segueing right into how to properly fill out your logbook. And as I go along, I will be referencing the paper logbook, but the same concepts apply to the electronic one as well. Now, when looking at the Glime logbook, there is a section on the top that says instrument with subsections of actual, simulated hood, and FTD or simulator. What instrument really means is time you are flying without any visual references and solely relying on the instruments in front of you. This instrument time is known as operating via IFR, or instrument flight rules, in IMC, or instrument meteorological conditions. And this is where the fun flying comes into play, in my opinion. Looking at the first subsection under instrument, the actual time, is time that you spent flying actual, real-time IMC in the aircraft while operating under IFR. The simulated hood time under instrument is time you spent flying in the actual aircraft under simulated IMC. This generally happens when you are with a safety pilot or a flight instructor and you'll be wearing some sort of view limiting device like blockles or foggles and are operating under VFR or visual flight rules. And during this time, it's the safety pilot's or the instructor's responsibility to see and avoid traffic as you are supposed to be looking at your instruments. Lastly, the FTD or simulator time under the instrument category is time that is spent inside of a simulator such as an FTD or flight training device or an ATD, aviation training device, where the outside conditions are simulating IMC. Once you get out of flight school and start looking for a job, the ones that they really care about are the actual and simulated time that are in the aircraft. However, the FTD and simulator instrument time can still be helpful, so don't count that out. And let's go over that. If you are looking to get your ATP certificate to go to the airlines or fly for 135 company, you will need at least 75 hours of instrument time. And up to 25 hours of that time can be done in an FFS, full flight simulator, or FTD, flight training device. And if you're in a part 142 training program, which the vast majority of you probably are not, you can use up to 50 hours of your FTD or FFS time towards that 75 required hours of instrument time. If you're not really sure what type of simulator yours is, I included a link in the show notes with details to tell you what kind of simulator you have been using. And also another link in the show notes to tell you the differences between each of those types, such as the difference between a BATD and an AATD. 
Now, when you're logging a simulator lesson, you're clearly not in the actual aircraft, right? So the only sections that should be filled out for your lesson in your logbook are the date, the aircraft type, which is your FTD, ATD, FFS, which if you're in your initial flight training, doing your private instrument, et cetera, I would be shocked if you had an FFS as it's a full flight simulator that you really only see in training centers such as flight safety or SimCom, stuff like that. They're actual full motion simulators that simulate the entire aircraft. You also need to make sure on your logbook you have the aircraft identifier. So if it's a Frasca, Redbird, Mentor, whatever it is, the number of approaches you've done for instrument, the type of approaches that you did for instrument, if you want to include that. And then your flight simulator time, if you have that flight simulator time section in your logbook. And then that's it. No PIC time, no flight time. That's it. The second reason that I prefer the Glime logbook is because of the cross-country subsections. I know it doesn't take much to make me happy, although I doubt my husband would agree with that. So there are two subsections to the cross-country section, and that is all and over 50 nautical miles. Not all paper logbooks have this distinction, and let me tell you why it's important. According to FAR 61.1, the definition of a cross-country flight is a flight that is completed by a person who holds a pilot certificate, completed in an aircraft, involved navigation systems such as dead reckoning, pilotage, radio aids to the destination, and that has a landing at a location other than the point of departure. With that in mind, every single flight where you go land somewhere else other than where you took off, even if it was just a five nautical mile flight, counts as a cross-country flight. But those short flights will go in the subsection all and not the subsection over 50 nautical miles. Pretty self-explanatory. Now you may be thinking, why does it matter if the flight is over 50 nautical miles? Man, you are such a forward thinker. Outstanding question. Well, if you head on over to 61.159, the link to which is in the show notes, and take a peek at those requirements to get your ATP certificate, you have to have 500 hours of cross-country time. But Holly, you just said I just need to do a hop and a skip and a jump and a five nautical mile flight, and that counts as cross-country time, right? Wrong. Even though it's not specifying it right here in 61.159, it means you have to have 500 hours of cross-country time for flights that are over 50 nautical miles. We know that because if you scoot back on over to 61.1 at the definition of cross country in terms of your ATP requirements, the flight has to have a straight line distance of at least 50 nautical miles from the point of departure. And there you have it. I've come to find that if you dive deep enough into the labyrinth that is the federal aviation regulations, sometimes you'll find more questions to your question, but sometimes, sometimes you might just find an answer. And this goes back to when you're prepping for your check rides to remember that you don't have to know everything, you just have to know where to find it. Now, say you did a flight that was 20 nautical miles, landed, and then did a flight that was 50 nautical miles from there. Technically, you can count both of those legs as cross-country time. And I included a link in the show notes to a clarification letter from the FAA with this distinction. So feel free to look at that if you need a good bedtime story. At the end of the day, just be sure to record all of your cross-country time and do it correctly. When looking through the Glime logbook, it, like most, has a couple of empty subsections for category and class that you can add as well, which is helpful. I actually use these two spots for my SIC time and my turbine time, because unfortunately I haven't gotten around to getting my seaplane rating, even though I've been wanting it for a while, but just haven't made the time. Basically, just use these blank spaces here at PD, or pilot's discretion. All right, now when it comes to logging PIC time, this can be tricky. In episode 15, Ways to Build Flight Hours, at around 3 minutes and 40 seconds, I talked about recording PIC time correctly when you're flying with another pilot to build hours. This is really for after you get your PPL. Please don't make me go over that again, so just go back and watch that at 3 minutes and 40 seconds to make sure that you've been logging your time building hours correctly. Now here's a good one for you guys. So if you zoned out and started scrolling, come back to me. If you're driving and listening to this, hopefully you didn't zone out at all because that's dangerous. As a student pilot going for your PPL, the only times you'll be recording PIC time is after you've received your endorsements and you go for a solo and when you do your check ride. Other than that, you cannot log PIC time until after you get your private pilot certificate or license. But once you get that private in a specific category and class, so for most of you first timers, that's going to be ASEL or Airplane Single Engine Land, that's the category and class. Well, any time after that, once you've gotten your PPL, when you are the sole manipulator of the controls of an ASEL or airplane single engine land, you can log PIC time. 
Even if it's a high-performance aircraft, a complex aircraft, or a tailwheel aircraft, you can log PIC. However, if you are flying one of those aircraft, you better have a safety pilot or a flight instructor with the proper endorsements to fly that aircraft sitting next to you. As in order for you to fly that aircraft solo PIC, you have to have those endorsements too. Otherwise, you're looking at the potential to get your license suspended or revoked, getting slapped by a fine by the FAA, or getting into a fun game of legal action with them. So until you get the endorsement for those kinds of aircraft, you will be logging PIC and or dual received when you are the sole manipulator of the aircraft controls. But no solo time until you get those endorsements. And that dual receive time I mentioned will only be logged when you are getting that instruction from an authorized instructor. If you're just with a safety pilot who is not a CFI, you will not be logging any dual receive time. And then that pilot that is giving you the instruction or is acting as your safety pilot, you know, the pilots that actually have the endorsement for that tailwheel high performance or complex aircraft, they will be acting as PIC. This is because logging PIC and acting as PIC are two completely different things. Looking at FAR 1.1, it states, quote, pilot in command means the person who, one, has final authority and responsibility for the operation and safety of the flight, two, has been designated as pilot in command before or during the flight, and three, holds the appropriate category, class, and type rating if appropriate for the conduct of the flight, end quote. And looking at FAR 61.51, it states, quote, a sport, recreational, private, commercial, or airline transport pilot may log pilot in command flight time for flights, except when logging flight time under 61159 when the pilot is the sole manipulator of the controls of an aircraft for which the pilot is rated or has sport pilot privileges for that category and class of aircraft if the aircraft class rating is appropriate, end quote. And that may have just sounded like a bunch of mumbo jumbo to you, but that's why I'm here and that's why I've been spelling this out for you guys. So as long as you are the sole manipulator of the controls of that category and class in which you are rated and you have an appropriately rated and endorsed pilot acting as pilot in command for you, that time is fair game, which makes your logbook happy because we all know how hungry your logbooks get for more and more flight time. Now, for clarification purposes, when a FAR or Federal Aviation Regulation refers to a rating or a rated pilot, it's talking about things like your instrument rating, your multi-engine or single-engine add-on rating to your commercial license, or even a rating such as a Gulfstream or a Citation rating. You can think of it like this. You have to take a check ride in order to receive a rating, just like an initial certificate. Tailwheel, high-performance, and complex aircraft only require an endorsement, no check ride needed. You only have to have that training from the authorized instructor for that instructor to give you that endorsement. Now remember, like I've mentioned, this only applies to the same category and class in which you're rated. So if you are ASEL rated or airplane single engine land rated and you're flying a high performance or complex aircraft, that is say a multi-engine land, an airplane single engine C or an airplane multi-engine C, you cannot log that time as PIC unless you're taking a check ride for that aircraft. We're almost done. Let's move on to other logging sections. This one is a real kicker, guys. I have explored in depth Part 61-159, which is the regulation that states the requirements to get your ATP certificate. And in there it states, one of those requirements is you have to have 100 hours of night flight time. Now looking at 61.159 Bravo, it says, quote, a person who has performed at least 20 night takeoffs and landings to a full stop may substitute each additional night takeoff and landing to a full stop for one hour of night flight time to satisfy the requirements of paragraph A2 of this section. However, not more than 25 hours of night flight time may be credited in this manner, end quote. Meaning if you have 40 night flight landings to a full stop, you can remove 20 of those full stop night landings from your logbook and convert them into 20 hours of night flight time. What? giving you 20 hours towards that 100 hours of required night flight time for ATP. So if you're slightly short on your ATP minimums for the night flight hours, why don't you go back and recalculate this in your logbook and see what you can get. But remember, like the reg states, you cannot use this for more than 25 hours of night flight time. Fun fact, there are technically three different versions of night in aviation that require different things. And that I'm going to talk about in the Aviator's Guide first ever ground lesson. hey -o. So look out for that because it's going to be good. Okay, so when it comes to the paper logbook, you won't always see a section for ground instruction. And that's because if you remember from my previous episodes, there's no required amount of ground instruction needed for Part 61. 
And Part 141 has a detailed syllabus approved by the FAA that states what each lesson has to cover for the ground training. So there's no need to keep track of any ground training for Part 141 schools. If you're doing Part 61, though, there is a section in the back of the paper logbook for your instructor to specify the subject matter and the date that subject matter was covered. This is really helpful to show or really prove to the DPE that you have covered all of the FA requirements to get that rating or certificate. The last tidbits today about your paper logbook are don't forget to sign every page of that logbook, especially before your check ride. And it's helpful for you to finish filling out the year at the top left corner of that logbook. And when instructors are signing your lessons in your paper and electronic logbooks, they have to make sure the length of the lesson is included as well as their name, their certificate number, their certificate expiration date, or the recency of experience. And that one is a new ruling as of December 1st, 2024, as there will no longer be new flight instructor certificates issued with an expiration date. You can check out 61.197 for more of that. And lastly, they have to include the type of flight and or ground instruction completed. If you're part 141 school, they'll probably just list the lesson that you did that day as that lesson states in the syllabus what all was completed that day. But if you're part 61, you need to spell it out. Steep turns, turns around a point, etc. Well, there you have it. I hope you guys feel more than efficient now to fill out your logbooks correctly. And if you guys have any further questions, comments, tribulations, or praise, please let me know. Now, on top of being an awesome pilot and diligent logger of your flight time, don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, review, and follow my show. Thanks, guys. It is the holidays after all, so show your fellow pilots some love. Speaking of that, Merry Christmas, or Happy Kwanzaa, or Happy Hanukkah. Happy holidays in general, you guys. You are all amazing. And if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, stay warm, if you can, and I will see you later, aviators.